th thank you for the, the opportunity uh, to visit today. Um, and if uh, Derek or whomever, um, Nick, if you uh, can just give us a heads up that everything sounds okay from your end, uh, that would be helpful. I can hear it and yep, see it's fine. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Well, um, I feel like we're among friends here today. Uh, many of you know both Carl and I uh, at the Institute for Decision Making, and this is uh, an extension of some work that we have been doing as far as our university center uh, here at the university, but also part of uh, Iowa's Manufacturing 4.0 Consortium. So um, Iowa State Cirrus, us, the Community College, Department of Ed, uh, multiple organizations uh, coming together around manufacturing 4.0. And I know that you have, uh, as recently as September, met with, with Mark Reinig, uh, who's on joining us today as well. Uh, but it's, an, it's a topic that we need to hit multiple times. And so I know that Mark uh, laid the foundation. We'll probably touch on a few of the things that Mark talked about as well, but I think that that's, that's valuable. And then hopefully uh, challenge you a bit uh, to think of some new or additional things because it, some of the stuff I, I just caught the last couple of minutes of your, of your meeting, just some of the things that you're talking about will certainly be impacted by manufacturing 4.0. And so what we're talking about today, the purpose uh, is to dig into those basics. So you, again, so you, when we start talking about industry 4.0, manufacturing 4.0, uh, you, you've got a pretty good frame of reference. Uh, talk about how uh, industries are adopting manufacturing 4.0, how even economic development will start uh, uh, adopting industry 4.0. And then as economic developers, when you are out there doing your business retention and expansion visits, can you gauge how these companies uh, are sitting when it comes to looking at adopting, uh, testing the waters or, or maybe uh, even serving as role models in your area as far as their overall readiness. And then we want to certainly touch on some uh, resources for you as economic developers that you can uh, put into your Rolodex, your, your, uh, your quiver as far as when you're out there working with businesses to, to help them uh, look at some of this. Because we sort of see as we've been in, in this space for the last um, oh, I don't know, 18 months, two years, we feel that there's going to be a, a bit of a change in how economic developers look at the interactions with their businesses, and, and we'll be visiting about uh, that. But our, our format is going to be uh, really open today. We're going to have some slides and some videos that we want to share, but we also want your and need your input as well. So Carl, if you could move on to the, the next slide. Um, Mark and Greg uh, are, are on uh, as well. I, I describe them as being our color commentators, if you will. Uh, both of them have uh, expertise from uh, Northeast Iowa Community College, from Cirrus, and also out there working with your businesses and, and kind, of, kind of talk from what they see as well. So guys, uh, you have the green light, as I've told you in the past, feel free to, to jump in and, and share uh, thoughts, comments, questions, concerns as we're moving forward. Carla, if you'd like to introduce yourself real quick. I'm sorry, I've been talking. Sure. Hi, I'm Carla. I work with James here at the Institute for Decision Making. And um, I'm just going to just plow right into the training since it, it um, does encompass a lot of information. And um, before we get started, though, you know, we talk about Industry 4.0 and Manufacturing 4.0, but um, your companies, your businesses probably don't think about it in terms of Industry 4.0. So that's kind of where we, we started this um, training was to try and start using the vocabulary that the businesses are going to be using. They, if you were to ask if they're um, you know, implementing any Industry 4.0 technologies, they probably would wonder what in the world you're talking about. So hopefully um, through our work today, we can... Um, give you enough of that um, background so that when you go in to talk to those businesses, you uh, you know what to ask, you know what to look for, um, and you know what kind of um, services can help them. So industry 4.0 is not just for manufacturing. So 
we're gonna, gonna start out with a little technology test. And um, we want you to think about a, a business because we want you to keep in mind this business throughout the training so that you could kind of think about ways that you can maybe help them or provide them um, with information. So, um, you know, try and think about the general scope of the businesses that you're serving in your area and then picture who owns it, what are they making, what are their employees doing, what kind of customers do they have? And we want you to kind of um, describe that business in two or three words. That first word is gonna be what type of business is it that you're thinking of? Is it a large or a small employer? That's the second word. And then is it local or non-local ownership? So I'm gonna give you a couple seconds here to grab your cell phone, go to menti.com, use the code 8988-5204 and enter three words. Is it the one, the three words are the type of business? Is it large or small employer? Is it local or non-local? And I'll give you a couple minutes here. This is the audience participation yep. part of our icebreaker. We don't have any music. For nope, no, no music. music. Can you music. pretend to do a drum roll, James? I, I could. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. All right. See how we're doing. Oh, so far, nobody. Come on, people. Carla, can you go back to that slide? Yeah. Can you? Okay. It's Carla, right up there up at the top, too. Here's the code up here. Eight nine eight eight five. In. So you want us to describe a, any business in two or three words? Yeah, the That's first word should be. Whoop. So I want your first word to be the type of business. Oh, okay, gotcha. Second okay. word to be: Is it a large or small? Just large or small? And then the third: local or non-local. Okay, we've got some coming on. Six people. Anybody else going to do it? <laughs> Seven. We have 19 people on the call. So far, manufacturing is really standing out, locally owned but also large and small, about the same amount. We'll give you one, one more person weigh in. Let's see what pops to the top. One more? Okay, I guess we're not gonna get one more, but thanks for everybody. But this is just kind of like a little example of technology that you can sort of start utilizing yourself as you try to you know, think of yourself as an a business that needs to start implementing Industry 4.0. But it looks like um, majority of people are looking at, are thinking of a local business, about half and half large and small. We've got restaurants, we've got ag, manufacturers, food production. So it's a whole variety. And that's the way it actually is when you're, um, when you're dealing with Industry 4.0 too. And just really keep those businesses in mind, because there's going to be a couple of different times that we're going to challenge you to be thinking about it. Just to kind of hold that business in the back of your head as we're moving forward. All right. So um, real quick, what is Industry 4.0 and how did we get here? Um, I've got a, a real simple little video here, but um, that just kind of talks about the evolution of why it's even called Industry 4.0. In the history of industry, there have been many revolutions. And now we're facing the next one, connectivity. But how can a company handle this? What does the industry of the future look like? Our experts have been wrestling with these questions for years. They know that the complete digitalization Sorry, everyone. In the history of industry, there have been many revolutions. And now we're facing the next one, connectivity. But how can a company handle this? What does the industry of the future look like? 
Our experts have been wrestling with these questions for years. They know that the complete digitalization of the manufacturing industry plays a key role in the process. Why? That's simple. In the future, it will be more important than ever to operate quickly, flexibly and cost-effectively. Product life cycles are becoming increasingly shorter, while product variants are becoming progressively larger. Just like large volumes, small quantities must be produced economically. Lead times will become shorter, so that delivery must become faster. For companies, this means that in the future, they must align their organization much more rigorously to meet customer needs. This can only be achieved if companies start today to digitize, automate, and above all, interconnect all processes. Not only within the company, but also along the entire value chain. This means a convergence of the various areas. Customers and business partners are part of the total process. The goal is to make all relevant data available anytime and be able to control the whole network of value creation in real time. From product planning and product and production development all the way up to production and logistics. Of course, data security must be assured at all times. Synchronizing digital and physical value streams not only increases productivity of companies, but also their efficiency, quality and innovative capacity. The Industry 4.0 concept isn't new, but unlike before, we now have the knowledge and technology for it to become affordable reality. As you can see, the industry of the future presents us with many opportunities, challenges and questions. But what's most important? What will you do? Let's shape the future together. So it's kind of interesting. This is kind of an old video, but talking back then about how this is the future. Well, it's actually here and people are actually talking about industry 5.0 already. So um, one of the things I find really interesting about the whole evolution of, of industry is that it started off really slow, took about 100 years to get to industry 2.0, and then another 100 years to get to 3.0, which was like um, some computers and automation. And then everything started accelerating. So industry 4.0 started about um, 2000 and, you know, with um, artificial intelligence, machine le learning, cyber physical systems, etc. So um, we should probably already be talking about industry 5.0. <laughs> first things first, you know, and the thing to think about guys is that economic development has also evolved over that timeline, but it's evolving quickly. So we're going to be talking about things that you might be able to do as an economic developer, but it's really going to challenge our field to become proactive and kind of um, more early adopting. You know, oftentimes I think we take more of a, a backseat and kind of let our businesses uh, dictate how our area or region is looking at this. Uh, there's rules for economic developers to bring uh, this this information up and get it in front of folks, but we know that it can be really overwhelming. Uh, when Mark visited with you, I know that he went through the the Cirrus uh, wheel, and that's the wheel that every state in the United States is utilizing. Is that they're looking at all these different uh, uh, aspects, and we'll go through those in a moment. But it can be a little bit challenge, you know, first saying, hey, you need to keep in mind things like the internet of things and robotics and automation and simulation. It can be like kind of crazy. So what we suggest economic developers do is first just think about through about how can you hop that back, please? Um, three buckets, um, three buckets, uh, managing information, designing and testing, producing and performing. So if you are going out into a business, if you can keep those three buckets going in your head to say, all right, I just need to be thinking about how they're managing the information that's coming in, whether it's in their supply chain or what they're creating. Um, I need to be thinking about, are they designing, are they testing, or, 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 and how are they approaching research and development? And then also, how are they producing and performing? That, that's a good way to start uh, and keep things kind of manageable. So uh, if we go to the second, the next slide, what one of the things that's 
uh, I find myself doing when I'm talking about manufacturing industry 4.0 is I think of all those nine different things. And I think that that's, that's it. But as the, as the video points out or suggests, all those individual pieces are kind of like tools, individual tools. Uh, so let's just talk about 3D printing, for example. You can have a company that's utilizing and dabbling and using 3D printing, maybe putting together some uh, displays for salespeople to use or, or using proto making prototypes, that kind of a thing. But that's all they're doing. And that's not part of the, that is part, but it's not a full utilization of industry 4.0. So when we talk about the nine pieces, that's like the, all the I, those are all I's. When we talk about industry 4.0 as an integrated full system, it's kind of like the whole central nervous system over here on the right, all the pieces working back together. And you can think of that as, it's easy to visualize, that's a supply chain. So if you think of a supply chain being the whole body, if John Deere, for example, is the head there, and some of your local uh, suppliers or businesses are the hands or the feet or the knees or what have you, there's constant going back and forth of information. So um, I was visiting with uh, Dan McDonald uh, just the other day, and you know he made the comment is that not a lot of our businesses are quite at the, um, we have, we've had a hard time getting to identify any of that are full central nervous system businesses. Even deer isn't there yet. We're kind of at the, everybody's got different kind of eyeballs and utilizing these in different ways, but it's headed to that full central nervous system model. So I hope that kind of makes sense. So when we're throwing out, when you hear industry 4.0, that's kind of that fully integrated system. Uh, Right now we're, we're at, in our evolution, we're kind of still at the individual tool pay, uh, phase. So um, we see in, Industry 4.0, those tools that James was talking about, um, making a difference in um, the customer experience, thinking about how you are, how a company is relating or um, keeping connected with their customers. Um, and so they're using that data and technology to improve the customer experience, or they're using that data and technology to support process e efficiencies. So maybe it's in um, taking in your sales information, um, or maybe it's how you're doing the development of your product or how you're delivering your service. And then also um, delivery of your final product. How are you um, you know, how are you keeping connected across the supply chain up and down? So I'm turning it back to you, James. Yeah, no, that's fine. So I, we want to visit a little bit about your business and retention expansion efforts, because that's that's really where this is going to come in. And again, as I pointed out, those keep those three buckets in mind. But the next slide, what that does is suggest that currently when we're out doing BRE, Let's say Nick's out there doing BRE visits. Generally speaking, our culture has been, we're an interviewer. We're out there interviewing folks and taking down their information. What we're suggesting is as industry 4.0, manufacturing 4.0 evolves, you're gonna be challenged to be more of an investigator than and just an interviewer. So economic developers, are once you're out there, you're going to start looking and kind of assessing as to, and looking for tea leaves within your businesses to try to figure out where they are at on this continuum. Are you working with people who are early adopters? Or is this business a laggard and they are really falling behind um, to kind of help think through that uh, approach? And so they're going to be a, a looking at technology adoption, uh, investing, are they investing in or considering different types of tools uh, those that I mentioned? Uh, are they looking at software and allowing products to be monitored real time uh, using analytics uh, and, and identifying if there's any uh, challenges along the way? So kind of that real time monitoring. And then are they using 
data to actually make their, some of their decisions. One of the things as you get into this, you're going to find is one of the byproducts of this is just huge, huge amounts of data. And so it's going to be, uh, it'll be good questions to talk to them about how are they using all this data? Are they using it at all? So for example, you could have a great, you could have a factory full of robots that's just cranking out all this data. But if you're not intentional in evaluating the data and trying to make strategic decisions, you're really missing a big opportunity. So that will be kind of, are, are we looking at the, the system that's creating the data, the data infrastructure? Do they have the right tools to process the data? And are their employees uh, skilled at making data-driven decisions and operations. So as we're talking about workforce, that's going to become a, a big piece as well. Are, are, are workers able to monitor the data and evaluate the data uh, to make decisions? So other things um, you could be looking for while you're out in your business visits are um, is whether or not that business is looking at um, different business models. Are they protecting their data by using um, the cloud or are they connecting with their customers or their supply chain using um, the cloud and the internet of things? How are they, um, how, how is their culture in terms of innovation, experimentation? Are they um, developing partnerships, um, working together with other businesses? Are they making investments in their R&D? And as you're out with the synchronous um, you know, form, there are questions about um, R&D investments and things like that. Feel free to like expand upon those with some additional questions that might dig a little deeper into whether or not they're thinking about um, uh, Industry 4.0 and the future of how they'll be doing business. Um, how are their teams? Do they have the right talent? Are they working collaboratively? You know, this speaks a little bit to um, uh, uh, the philosophy of entrepreneurship, right? Are they um, working together? Are they encouraging employees to offer ideas, encouraging employees to, um, uh, to learn about new technologies? And then what is the whole culture like? Um, are, do their employees feel like they're part of um, the purpose of the uh, business? Are they um, feeling like they're, they're um, just doing a day-to-day -day job or do they really feel like they're part of creating change and being able to give um, input when when uh, they have it excellent so, yeah i'm um, okay sorry go ahead james and, and mark i'm going to call on you here in a minute so uh um, be on deck but getting back to that interviewer versus investigator piece there are a there are going to be quite a few things that a local economic developer can do related to uh, Industry 4.0. And here's just kind of a, a short list, uh, just a couple of things to think about. So building your own connections with Industry 4.0 vendors and providers so that you have folks to uh, connect with. So for example, um, Carla and I, just in doing our, our uh, these workshops, have built relationships with a couple different vendors that are 3D printer vendors or have uh, robots or cobots that they do, that they sell. But they have a huge education piece that they're willing. And they have on their websites, they have things like virtual ec trade shows that you can go and kick the tires of some of these different things and see. And they're always very willing to jump on uh, videos like this or sit in on training uh, opportunities. Obviously, they're trying to sell stuff. That's the, we, we get that. But as economic developers, it's good to have uh, a few of these folks in your back pockets so that you might be able to, not, you're not trying to sell them to your businesses, but you can use them uh, as a resource to help answer questions. And so uh, you can do things like, put together tours or have educational workshops. I, I'd even encourage you to have educational workshops for some of your, your economic development boards. Uh, have a vendor sit in on uh, an economic development board meeting and show 
uh, kind of their bells and whistles of what they do. It will just start to create that culture of people thinking about manufacturing in uh, Industry 4.0. You're also uh, going to need to be thinking about how your board and your communities think about criteria for your incentives and awards and economic impact, because it may not be jobs. Uh, it may it may not be acres of land. It might not be um, uh, other other more more common or, or rural frequent ones. You may have to come up with some new ones or or help them understand how utility usage, uh, because this is a maybe a fully automated company, but wow, well, look what it's actually doing for our, our community. Or uh, thinking about that supply chain, how is it impacting the supply chain of all of our businesses? So there's going to be points in time where you need to have intentional conversations with your boards and your communities so that they're not in just the jobs mentality for evaluating the project. And then you have some kind of new project come up and we're starting from scratch. So it's going to We'll be encouraging you to be proactive when thinking about this kind of stuff. Mark, um, I wanted to pick your brain for a minute. As you've been um, kind of getting into this Industry 4.0 game, thoughts that you have as far as how it's going to impact economic development? Well, James, as, as you've mentioned, I think a lot of it's going to impact when you're going out for your synchronous visits or if you don't really do synchronous, just your visits with your companies. And it does go all the way from retail all the way up to uh, the stronger manufacturers. Uh, just the impact, we see it if, if your suppliers, if you're a supplier into a larger OEM, their companies are already having to convert over to some very simple manufacturing 4.0 on the digital side of it. But if they haven't, they're going to be lost. Uh, they're, they're going to lose contracts. They're going to lose their position with suppliers. All those things, they need to be getting themselves up to speed. Uh, right now, I'd like, I think this would be a good time to, you know, you were talking about a lot of the different things at ISU. We have at Cirrus, we have the digital uh, manufacturing lab, and that's a coordination between us, Alliant Energy, and IEDA, where we're looking at bringing all types of equipment. We have things that are cobots. We have different 3D printers. We have uh, software that you can adjust to your system. We have wearable sensors. We have tower lights that help look at how the whole process goes through. So there are so many other ways that you can take your companies and then, you know, take them to Cirrus, take them to the other universities that have opportunities for them to expand their digital manufacturing experience. One of the things also at Cirrus is we have a series of, of uh, webinars that are posted on our site under Manufacturing 4.0. We've got some slides coming up, Mark, on all that. Good. Well, then I can be quiet then. No, no, it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> we got you, man. We got you covered. But, but but the key is, as I go across the state, is that it's confusing for your businesses and manufacturing. What's manufacturing 4.0? How does it affect us? So it's important to you know understand this yourself because at least you can point them in the direction they need to go. Because when that need arises, it isn't like, oh, we can phase you in over six months. They have to go now. And how can you help them achieve that through, you know, your knowledge of what you're learning today? I think that's the most important. And, and it sure, Mark, it sure doesn't seem this is a flavor of the day, does it? I know some no. of the people I've talked to or developers have said, well, man, we, you know, we always, there's always stuff we're getting thrown at, thrown at this survey, that thing we need to think about. Now we got industry 4.0. It sure doesn't seem like it's going to be a flavor of the day. No, we've, the national, where we get funded through National Manufacturing Extension Partnership, ton of money going into this all across the United States. They're revamping systems, revamping programs that they assist manufacturers with all around manufacturing 4.0, because it is going, it is the next industrial revolution and it is here. 
Uh, to that extreme level, they say 5.0, yes, but it's all based around industry 4.0. So mm -hmm. it's very important to get this. Yeah. Well, let's dig into it a little bit, Carl. Let's go into some of those. I know Mark talked to them a while, about it a, a couple of months back, but it might be good to, just to think about a few of those. And before we go into um, the technologies, I just wanted to say we're going to share this slide deck with you. And so all of the links that we're using will be live links that you can go back to um, share with your board members or, or um, check out the, the um, uh, Pod, uh, podcast that Mark was talking about or the webinars. So those we have links for all of those in this presentation. Yeah, awesome. Let's think about those three buckets and jump into one. So kind of the one that's the sexiest or the most sizzle anyway, uh, producing and performing. So robotics and automation and 3D printing are areas um, that we're probably all, all have seen or have been in workshops and have seen some kind of a thing. But this is definitely an area that's going to be, uh, I would say, when you're looking at early adoption, probably these are two areas that are going to be early adoption. Carla, we've got a couple of, of interesting videos for you all to take a look at. And then we, then we got some questions. So what we want you to be doing is thinking about not just, oh, this is interesting, but thinking about how it might be able to be deployed. Um, uh, you know, kind of deployed in whether you're Delaware County or Dubuque County or, or Wacon or wherever, be thinking about how that can be used just locally. And I just wanted to just add as part of our research when we were putting this training together was we were talking to um, John Deere and part of their supplier assessment is actually whether or not those suppliers are using like 3D printing or additive manufacturing at some level, whether it's for sampling, tooling, molds, etc. Um, and, and they are not telling their suppliers what they need to do. They're just moving on to the next supplier. So it's very important to stay competitive, um, that, they're, uh, uh, that your businesses are really considering where some of these technologies can fit in. All right, we'll start with um, Universal Robots. And this is um, in Rock, Rock Valley? Rock Valley, Iowa. Rock Valley, why not? We're Siliam Fabricating, located in Rock Valley, Iowa. We fabricate parts for multiple customers all over the United States. So we consider automation throughout uh, the factory, and welding has become one of our bottlenecks. It's hard to hire welders in our area. It always seems like we're short a hand welder. So the traditional welding robot requires today a lot of fixturing, programming, fencing and safeguarding. We wanted to get our welders to spend more time fabricating and putting parts together versus laying a bead. And we wanted this robot to mimic what a hand welder was capable of doing. We already have a UR robot that we use for some other applications. And the first thought was, can we stick a welding arm on the end of our UR robot and make it weld? I came across BotX. And what I instantly liked was it's mobility, its ease of use, and its programming features. Air gas and hybotics showed up to do the install, which didn't take very long. And we were pretty ecstatic that we were creating production parts within half a day already. When we look at some of the traditional robots, the costs kind of just keep creeping up, right? Easily $100,000 to start by the time and you might even end up at two to 300,000. And when we were looking at the BotX, it didn't take long to realize how simple it was and it just worked. We were able to lease the machine. So for a very low upfront cost, I could let my hand welders and my owners see it with a very low risk. And it was within a month and we already bought the machine. The fact that the robot was under the price of traditional robots by a lot. And it's already within a half day producing production parts. It didn't even need a traditional ROI. What we were able to do now is take that knowledge of a welder and let him move the robot as if he was just doing it by hand and creating that program on the fly. And it was something we had always hoped for and we found the solution. We specifically chose the UR10E because it had the best balance of reach and mobility and portability. They have force torque sensing built into the six axes, which we use for various features in our robot. UR is constantly updating their product and they constantly roll that out to their users. That's vitally important to us as an example. 
um, they, they rolled out path offset and we were able to use that to develop a much higher quality weaving um, feature um, that our end customers were looking for. Robotic has taught us how to do some more complex welds that we weren't even doing on our traditional robot. Having used the UR robot, we're able to use the weaving feature and take away a double or triple pass. So what might have been a three minute weld is cut down to maybe a minute and a half. It also takes away from consumables since we're not laying all that extra gas and bead. I was really excited to cut my time in half, actually being able to move it by hand like that, being able to get it to point A to point B in a fraction of the time. We can use our hand fixtures, which cuts cost in half. We can get a new part in today and we can put it on that robot without a fixture and have it programmed that day. It can save up to a week. I feel a lot more like a welder. It was awesome. What I would say made me most excited was, okay, now I can actually program a ro robot myself. I can really make welds look nice and not have to spend a year in the classroom l learning it. I can just grab the torch and say, hey, this is right where I want it. This is, feels good, comfortable when I hand weld this and it comes out good. And so then I can program that. And if you want a linear or radial weld, a joint or a butt weld, that's very clear. We have not had any downtime with the BotX. The UR robot has its own little weld booth cell today where it lives. However, we do move it around quite a bit. We're also trying to put more on the robot to increase cycle time. We bought our first universal robot. We wanted to test it in stamping. The robot stamps parts all day long. It just puts the part in, actuates the machine to stamp it and pelletizes the part. We use the pelletizing wizard on load side of the robot. Very easy to understand. Because we're a high mix, low volume shop, it's often very different number of pellets and parts. The beautiful thing is, is once it's programmed, it's done. The other side of the shop has the traditional CNC machines, mills and lays, and we're looking to bring our stamping robot over there to do some machine tending and adding more to that fleet as well. So we like to show those, uh, again, we're not, we're not out here trying to sell universal robots and you shouldn't be either, but uh, that's something that Carl and I have been able to develop quite easily over the past year or so is just uh, connections with folks just like that. So that as you're visiting there, you know, I think I, I tend to think that sometimes it's almost intimidating to, to have that workforce development question coming up, meaning we, we know that the community college is doing an amazing job of training you in schools or, and you're working at, at the long-term solutions, but sometimes you need those immediate solutions. And it, it, it's, to have something kind of in the in your back pocket to say, uh, here's something to at least consider. And there are multiple vendors out there uh, to take a look at. So we'll get back to the uh, robotics and automation in a minute, but let's talk about 3D printing. Uh, I think we've probably all seen 3D printers and, and how they work. Um, we visited with a company here locally that invested in a 3D printer and basically it sat underneath the stairs for, for months, if not a year, collecting dust, dust because somebody thought it was a good idea, but nobody used it. Uh, but they let the uh, sales department use it and they started printing uh, examples of uh, their, their uh, products and parts to take out on the road, lighter, easier, manageable to take on the airplanes and things like that, uh, kind of sparked interest in 3D printing within that manufacturer. And then now it's fully integrated to what they're doing. Um, so we've probably seen or heard of examples like this, uh, but 3D printing of homes uh, is kind of where, uh, it's kind of a whole different app application, especially in our rural communities in Iowa where we talk about housing every day. So Carl, let's take a look at this story. It looks like some sort of industrial soft serve machine, precisely pouring its pattern one layer at a time. What this giant robot is doing is hard to wrap your head around. It's printing a house. This is a house 25. Jason Ballard is the CEO of Icon, a company in Austin, Texas, using massive 3D printers to redesign home building. And so is the future that we're all going to be out for a walk some night seeing robots building houses down the street? Robotic construction is absolutely our future. 
This is a complete transformation in the way that we approach sheltering ourselves, in the way that we approach building. This nearly five-ton machine follows a computerized blueprint and can build the entire wall system of a home with a concrete mixture in less than a week. Traditional construction is used for the foundation, the roof, wiring, and plumbing. But printing the walls is several times faster than wood framing, and Icon says the concrete structures are highly energy efficient and can better withstand natural disasters. So this house has curves. That's right. And you don't have to live in a boring box. These wavy 3D printed walls will eventually become this high design home. 3D printed homes are rare, but they're starting to pop up all over the world. These domes in Italy were printed out of dirt in 200 hours. And another company plans to build the first 3D printed neighborhood in the United States in the California desert near Palm Springs. So why are they catching on? Cost and speed. Icon is trying to cut the cost of construction in half while building homes twice as fast, something some housing market experts doubt is possible. But what's not in question is that the U.S. is currently 4 million homes short of buyer demand. We need housing for homeless folks. We need affordable starter houses. We need middle market houses. So we need more of every kind of house, period. Also, construction work is hard. This doesn't get tired. Yes, humans get tired doing this kind of work, but yeah. humans need jobs. There's a, a nationwide shortage of skilled labor and construction professionals. We're filling a gap where there's not enough job. So this bedroom right here, could be a home office, could be a guest bedroom. Could, Paulo you know, Soriano and his fiancée, Shay really... Craig, have been struggling to buy a home in Austin's red-hot housing market. Each of these houses was printed in about a week. Oh, wow. They came to look at some of the first 3D printed homes for sale in the country. The first level of this four-bedroom, four-bathroom house is printed concrete. The second floor is conventional construction. It will be listed for around $700,000. So would you seriously consider buying something like this? Absolutely. 100%. Yeah. 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 This is really such a good value in terms of space and the amount of bedrooms. You know, we want to start a family one day. We definitely need extra bedrooms to accommodate that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, the subtle <laughs> hint. Be a little different. This is the way we should be built. Jason Ballard is also using this new technology to shoot for the moon. His company is working with NASA to design 3D printed shelter for astronauts who could one day live on the moon and Mars. I think this makes construction exciting again and it's inspiring and hopeful to have a solution. Yeah, so like James said, the market is a lot different there, so. Yeah, so they're not gonna go for $700,000 in Iowa, but oh, here's a slide. You may be thinking, oh, wow, that's great, it's going on, but Stanton, Iowa, Western Iowa, uh, this article is talking, We were, if you were at the Rural Summit, there was uh, this gentleman uh, from this company, Kevin Cabbage, uh, and was is working out in Stanton, Iowa. So if you're sitting in Piasta, if you're, uh, you know, in, in, in Dyersville or wherever, uh, this could certainly be a strategy that as an economic developer, you can push to get on people's radar screens. Obviously, the Economic Development Office may not be uh, the one that is buying a, a 3D printer, obviously, and doing it. But can you be convening your um, building inspections office, your realtors, your contractors together and thinking this through proactively so that uh, it can be uh, it can occur and you can be an earlier adopter rather than kind of that lagger model. And also encouraging your city um, partners to um, review codes to make sure that houses like this would be allowed. Yeah. So we've talked about, um, we've talked about, we've talked about the automation side of things, the robotics, we've talked about 3D printing. Here's a brainstorming section for you all. Now, this is, again, an audience participation perspective. <laughs> what could Nibbin or PEI do related to these topics? If you're an economic developer, what might you do? And I'll start calling on people too. So you just hop on and throw out an idea. What could you do related to this? Nick, any thoughts? You're well, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in before you called on me, James. So don't. Uh, <laughs> uh, 
Well, I think you kind of touched on it. You, you said convene, for instance, with the 3D printing of, of houses, convening some of the um, existing industry groups that uh, that meet on housing construction and uh, meet you know the the challenges of housing currently um, because I know we've um, we had some conversation uh, with a builders group in Jackson County uh, previously where there was a little bit of fear um, amongst the the skilled trades that this was coming for their their jobs the the concept of of uh, 3D printing housing. And, you know, I think we've all heard that automation reaction in the past, um, but right now, maybe it's a good time to have that conversation because um, it's difficult to find framers or it's difficult to find um, some of the skilled trades persons, especially in rural communities too. But um, so maybe convening those meetings and, and in, in a proactive way, looking at one of these uh, manufacturing 4.0 technologies um, to see the benefit and the vision maybe for the future. Excellent, excellent. Donna uh, in the chat said uh, workshops and tours to see firsthand. Um, uh, Donna, do you have anything, the additional thing you wanna hop on and, and any thoughts? I'm assuming you're, are you talking about the 3D printing or the automation or both? Sorry, all of the above, okay. because I think we need to, again, I echo what, what Nick said, that we have to make sure we don't have a fear of people that are coming after our jobs, but yet we also have to be, as you mentioned, realistic. This is the future, and um, how are we going to make sure all of our businesses survive and retrain or refocus those folks um, into some more computer skills, too? Absolutely. I would love to make a trip. Um, you know, we we did a trip out to Clarion one time as a group, but let's let's think where else we could go. Yeah, Excellent. Yeah. Developers meeting Darla. Uh, uh, great. Uh, I love I love the comments that are in the chat. Um, let's take a look at uh, you guys are hitting on some of the things that we identified. And uh, if you want to hit that, Carla, um, exactly what you're talking about. So. Get out there. We talked about building the connection with providers. Uh, whether you could have a little a little expo or tour uh, local manufacturers that are applying that, or even in your region, put together a, a, an educational a workshop um, down here. Consider you can definitely utilize. Sears has a ton of things, as uh, Mark pointed out. Uh, could you? Put together a, a common space, a maker space out in your industrial park in a vacant, in a vacant uh, or a spec building, or, or have Cirrus do a mini uh, expo in your spec building where people could come out and, and kick the tires. Uh, recruit Cirrus for workshops. I've got a video or a, a picture there over on the right. Uh, our friend Nick Glue over in Marion County. He worked with Cirrus and Alliant to have uh, a session, an online session for his businesses that, that talked about exactly what Mark identified. So Nick's doing it, big borrow and steal that from him and uh, do that for yourselves as well. People that wouldn't necessarily have to, I would encourage you to get people out there to kick the tires, but sometimes they can't get in the car and drive there. Uh, utilize the online resource as well. There's tons of uh, videos out there that you can send. send uh, I, I put down here, BRE follow-up, opt-in. You know, kind of, you don't want to drown your manufacturers, your businesses in videos uh, and, and links, but have them kind of opt-in, at least say, hey, I'm trying to, to build, uh, get this kind of information out to people who are interested and willing uh, if you're interested, can I put you down on the list and we'll send you vid videos, you know, so you're not inundated and then they can always opt out. But those are just some things there um, to, uh, to consider. I, I mentioned lo getting local testimonials for those companies that are doing that and getting those onto your website so that if, a, if an outside company or anybody, even your local investors are looking at your EDL, they can start to see, oh, uh, 
we're starting to, as an organization, we're starting to, to function in that space as well. So just some things to think about. And I, I would just add one clarification going back to that video from Rock Valley. You know, he talks about um, cages and I just wanted to clarify that a robot um, generally has to be caged off from people when it's working, but a cobot is designed so that the human uh, robotic uh, interface can be right next to each other. And so um, just as you're out there talking about robots versus cobots so that you have an understanding of what those differences are. And they also didn't mention, they mentioned the cost of uh, other robots, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Typically, the what you saw there, it's going to be like a fifty or sixty thousand dollar item to purchase, and then the the tooling, the different like if you had a welding tool, that's going to be uh, uh, maybe you know ten thousand dollars extra uh, that you might that they might be connecting with another company to provide that. But if you think of more in the fifty to seventy five thousand dollar space versus hundreds of thousands of dollars and that there's leasing options that might be of assistance too. All right, so we're going to move on to kind of that designing and testing bucket and that's where um, we see the uh, the technologies of augmented reality or virtual reality really coming into play. Um, you already saw uh, from some of those videos, how cell phones are playing a key role in, um, you know, um, monitoring the data that was coming from the welding tools or um, designing the process that it was going to be um, taking. So kind of augmented reality is really just um, you're looking at a uh, an image, but it's um, kind of an overlay of um, augmentation to it there where there's computer generated imagery on top of it and then virtual reality is a is an entire computer uh, computer generated um, image and then simulation is just kind of using um, 3d prototyping or testing to you know again save time materials it's a lot safer um, for the for the workforce as well but it's just using that technology to create um, models or, um, you know, uh, prototypes that are going to be used and, and looking for the issues in, in the process or in the development of the product. So kind of um, helping reduce the waste of um, making a model out of the actual uh, components that you would be producing an item from. So we have a couple of videos here. First one is on augmented reality. Here are the top four reasons why augmented reality will optimize your manufacturing operations. Number one, increase manufacturing throughput. With AR, you can provide clear step-by-step -step assembly instructions and remote guidance to help boost productivity and reduce avoidable errors. Number two, accelerate training. As many manufacturing experts approach retirement, AR technology can capture and transfer their knowledge to the next generation. AR can also accelerate the learning curve of new hires through real-time interactive 3D digital training. Number three, reduce costs. AR provides unprecedented clarity into processes and integrated IoT data enables quick reactions to problems and allows you to address issues before they occur. Number 4. Improve operator efficiency and safety. AR provides step-by-step -step instructions for everything from assembly processes to machine setup, changeover, and maintenance. Real-time visual directions reduce the time spent interpreting instructions, improve productivity, and enhance overall worker safety. Augmented reality enhances the entire manufacturing process, from improving throughput to accelerating training, reducing costs, and improving operator performance. AR will change... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it was getting to the commercial part. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> Um, what some of you guys may already be using AR or VR with your um, industrial sites, or if you've got them up, if you've had any image imaging uh, done on those sites, so that people can visualize what a spec building might look like on those sites. Um, so our next video here is um, about simulation. It's a little longer. Um, 
Well, maybe that's not the one that's a little longer, but there's no words to this one. So it's just a matter of seeing what um, simulation kind of looks like in the real world. simulating a process looking for issues. Think about expansion, uh, BRE, and think about what kind of company individual envision what is the new space might look like. So we've talked we've talked about both uh, the simulation and the AR. Let's let's do some brainstorming again. And, and we threw a few things on here, but but see if you might be able to come up with some of your own. And Greg, I'm going to ask you to please jump in here from uh, uh, NICC's perspective on on any thoughts related to to uh, what we've talked about or specifically on this this topic. So, you know, thinking about again those vendor education videos, getting those folk getting those videos out in front in front of folks, pretty straightforward. Could could AR be uh, an added deliverable with uh, NICC community college training. So they're out there doing workforce training, but could we have that be a, a supplemental uh, to keep uh, so that folks can continue to use that? Uh, almost every next point, almost every one of the strategic planning sessions I've done over the last month or so with different economic development organizations has brought up uh, the the refugees from Afghanistan that have come to Iowa to to work, the ones that were uh, helping the the, um, the military over there and coming to Iowa, thinking about how do you how do you be more how could you be more uh, strategic and how could you really be successful in trying to attract those folks uh, to your community to to live and work well. Could you incorporate that into the some of the AR into the training of these individuals? You know, if, if companies are out there scratching their heads, thinking, "All right, well, we know that translations and, and uh, language barriers are going to be a challenge, perhaps, or or whatever." That's a role that economic developer might be able to say: "Is hey, could we look at utilizing AR to help?" Uh, in the training of these individuals? Could you even pay for the translation costs? Uh, things like that. Um, I mentioned this on while the video is going, incorporating simulation in your own site. So I think economic development organizations are gonna have to practice what we preach so that as you go to your sites, does it look kind of like a uh, you have been impacted by the industry 4.0 pixie dust? Does it look like a community that uh, is comfortable in it and uh, utilizes this space. So even in your location and expansion services, some of that simulation software is pretty straightforward. Um, or you could you could work with NICC or uh, University of Dubuque or Lois or Clark to put together some kind of resources that they could be running the simulation software, whether it's for someone looking to expand in your industrial park, or maybe even some of your small businesses uh, that need to, to think about some of this stuff. Could you put some collaborations together like that? Again, bringing folks to the table. Greg, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of uh, ask you to just to, any comments so far or on this issue. Um, thanks. Um, typically, James, uh, the uh, Augmented reality and simulation is, is a little bit harder to grasp, I would say, initially, uh, as I've been in several manufacturers around our area. Some, you know, AR is, is not readily implemented at this point in time, at least in our mainstream manufacturers. Um, so that concept, I think, is one of the few that is, at this point, maybe a little bit of a stretch, uh, at least is what I've seen. So I've, I've been 
but certainly the, the cobots, uh, the, those universal robots that we saw in the previous um, videos, uh, one of our Dubuque, our Piasta companies, I just saw four of them being implemented on the floor there. So I think those, the, the reality of, of robots and reducing or, or helping to um, utilize them for their workforce shortage is definitely more readily uh, being thought about. I think most of the companies that I visited with the, uh, the the grants, the statewide grants for both the small business organizations and then that next level, that's where a lot of them are trying to take that deeper dive into trying to help with that workforce shortage. But the augmented reality and how that's going to be played out, um, I think that at this point in time, I haven't seen as many uh, companies bring that into their foray of uh, technologies in the 4.0 uh, industry um, sector yet. Um, okay. okay, excellent. Other, anybody have any thoughts, comments on uh, how you might, how we might be able to um, move forward as a region in these two areas? Anything else additional to the, to the bullet points up here on here? No. All right. So, one of the things that I oh, was go thinking, ahead. This is Jackie um, Ray from Dyersville Economic Development. Hi, Jackie. One of the things that I was thinking of is the for smaller um, economic development organizations to have somebody in the region that would be able to be trained on this to show our employers and um, you know, make it workforce, what, whatever the situation is, to have that uh, available in the region would be helpful because you know, this, this gets pretty out there into the shove on the back burner because you got so much going on right in front of your face. Do any of you have um, virtual tours of any of your buildings or um, sites? I have one company that that does that. Um, they haven't really brought it. I mean, they they do their own buildings, um, but haven't really brought it to the customer. You know, haven't really done much in terms of uh, providing that in RFPs or anything like that. And you know, uh, Jackie, as you were talking, uh, we're we're kind of at that almost at the squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of uh, point in time, meaning um, there are, there are going to be communities that, for example, Cirrus or NICC works with. If you just say, hey, we're, we're scratching our heads and want to do something, could we kick this around with you? And, and even here at UNI, for example, there's all the, there's sort of disparate pieces of folks that do cool things but until there's an application or getting people around the table to talk it through, maybe it's not just top of mind. But if developers are out there saying exactly kind of what you're at, maybe we want to put together, we want to get a, a, an intern, uh, a regional intern to, to start looking at some of this, or perhaps it ends up being a, uh, an employee. How might that look and feel? Or you know, could we get somebody? To, or is there a grad student out there that's looking for a grad assistantship? Whatever it might be, um, just to kind of think it through. And I, Val uh, brings up a good point to kind of incorporate it into one company locally and share their story with others. Uh, absolutely, this is going to be one of the things about an economic developer in Industry 4.0 is being that public relations. Uh, agent to tell the story because then that's why people can and, and get and also give them an opportunity to kick the tires uh, a couple uh, this summer one of the university uh, here the, the had a, a company that has a mobile 3d lab so you can envision kind of a big oversized trailer with a bunch of interesting machines doing stuff and different kinds of um, metal and plastics and what have you. And it was 
Carla and I went through it, Drew here, we, we toured it and it was interesting, but we also kind of got to be flies on the wall and hearing some of the area of regional businesses actually kind of just kicking the tires and brainstorming with the salesperson or the representative. Uh, and you could just literally hear the little light bulbs going off as they were talking. And so thinking about how we could bring some of this kind of stuff together, maybe as a region, uh, makes it a little bit more efficient for vendors or university or what have you to, to come in and help you. Carla, any other thoughts on that? I think we've hit most of the things. No. Okay, real good. Okay, so our next bucket is that managing information. And like James alluded to earlier, there's just a whole bunch of data that's being collected um, from machinery to applications. Um, all across the board. So all of that information collectively is called big data. You know, your personal devices are collecting it. There are sensors on um, machines, sensors in your cell phone, things like that. Um, but being able to learn from those and make adjustments and using that data to predict or, you know, predict like when a machine's going to need repair or improve your product line or be better at marketing, et cetera. So that's how you're using that big data in terms of managing that information. So um, cloud computing, you've all heard of cloud computing. That's just storing your um, data um, and accessing your data offsite. So it gives you a, a larger capacity, um, better data security, and so on and so forth. Um, system integration, that's really talking about how you're sharing your data, both across the factory floor or up and down the supply chain. Someone we talked to when we were first um, um, uh, putting this training together said that system integration is, is the key. And if you are out doing your um, visits with businesses and you're seeing folders um, on the shop floor following parts from place to place, that they need to start looking at how they can integrate their system a little better. No more folders on the shop floor. <laughs> he was kind of preaching that out. Hey, Carla, what's um, 60%? Didn't they say 60% of a, a, a existing equipment in many of these manufacturers is not it, um, capable of... Of having sensors added. Yeah. Um, but there are a lot of tools that... Um, uh, well, I guess when we get to the point where we're talking about, um, you know, the, the grants that are out there from IEDA, this might be something um, where those uh, and uh, businesses are going to be looking at, okay, how do we bring in a piece of equipment that is sensorized? Or how do we make an old piece of equipment sensorized? How do we add sensors to it? Um, cybersecurity is really key. Carla, now. Yeah, Carla yes, can I, this is Greg. I would like to add that in our roundtable discussions on Industry 4.0 and I just and I CC just uh, recently housed, um, there are two companies that were a part of our roundtables that had older equipment, but they were able to do add-on uh, sensor uh, devices as an add-on for that system integration piece. And the, actually, the companies were sharing information back and forth because of the cost. Uh, one company thought they were cost prohibitive at about a thousand dollars a pop. The other one said they were able to find them for much cheaper in the hundred fifty to two hundred fifty dollars. So there is there is technology out there that you can do add on to, to equipment. It's just getting those resources, and it was interesting because of those roundtable discussions. There was a lot of information being shared amongst our manufacturers in those conversations, which was a huge benefit of having those roundtables. Yeah, and we'll talk more about that. Um, the roundtables are part of what the consortium is doing across the state. We had one at Hawkeye that I was able to participate in, and and Greg is is really right. I mean, once those manufacturers were in a room together and started talking about the issues they were having um, or the things they wanted to solve through technology, they really started um, sharing a lot of great um, tips and. Uh, information with one another. And I think they got almost more value out of being together in a room um, than uh, we did trying to figure out, well, what kind of training might they, might they need going forward? So um, something else to think about is what, what can I as an economic developer do? Can I bring three or four manufacturers together just to talk tech? 
Um, so anyway, cybersecurity, you all know how important that is. You've heard about it in the news, the damage that can be done. Um, and then the Internet of Things is just a, a that's just what's allowing all of Industry 4.0 to happen. It's allowing the connectivity that enables Industry 4.0. Greg, um, do does NICC do anything related to cybersecurity? You know, I, I don't know if you. I mean, out. I mean, I, internally for sure, but I just didn't know. If right. No, we we've in in talking with Michael Donald with Cirrus in Iowa. There's really only a like one or two companies that offer the expertise as far as integrating uh, cybersecurity at at the level that most manufacturers need to get into. So I think it's, there's a huge gap there, James, yeah. but yeah, we've not, we're not going to dive into uh, that because of the legal ramifications with it. Yeah. Um, you know, we can provide some training for, but most of that is being done again at a much higher level than what we're able to bring in, you know, that expertise into our area um, and probably not wanting to get into because again, of the, the legalities of that and, liabilities that can occur. So I would say that's something we, at this point in time, we will not venture into. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So this next next video is kind of um, long and a bit of an advertisement from one of those companies <laughs> Greg is talking about, um, but it does kind of help you think about things that your company should be talking about or thinking about as they're moving forward. So this video is about cyber risk and advanced manufacturing. The manufacturing industry is innovating at an unprecedented rate, integrating cutting-edge technologies and products, automating the shop floor, connecting supply chains, and increasingly investing in valuable intellectual property. The industry is likely to see continued acceleration in the pace of technological change and associated cyber risks. Deloitte and Maypie collaborated to study the current state of cyber risk in advanced manufacturing anticipate emerging risks associated with new technologies, and identify leading practices manufacturers can adopt to face these risks head-on and become more secure, vigilant, and resilient. Nearly 50% of executives surveyed indicate they lack confidence their company's assets are protected from external threats. And 48% of cyber risk executives surveyed believe while senior management is committed to improving the company's cyber risk profile, obtaining adequate funding to support key cyber initiatives such as risk assessment, data protection, cyber threat monitoring, incident response planning, and employee awareness remains a significant challenge. The IT department can't do it alone. That means every employee needs to understand the role they play, from the shop floor to the R&D team to the C-suite to adopt a culture that is proactive about managing cyber risks. Company boards need to clearly understand the company's true cyber risk profile as well, so they can appropriately prioritize resource allocation in alignment with the company's risk tolerance. Intellectual property is consistently ranked by executives as a top cyber risk concern too. In fact, 35% of executives believe that theft of intellectual property was the primary motive of their most recent cyber attack. Preventive and detective data protection strategies can help a company to secure their data from the inside out. Shop floors are increasingly vulnerable. Yet 50% of surveyed companies indicate they perform vulnerability testing for industrial control systems less than once a month. 31% have never done an assessment. By implementing technologies to provide automated 24-7 cyber threat monitoring, manufacturers can become more vigilant in protecting critical manufacturing operations. IoT technologies are driving an exponential increase in connected products and associated cyber risks. Yet 37% of companies surveyed do not include connected products in cyber incident response plans. Planning ahead before a breach occurs can help companies become more resilient. Cyber risk and innovation are inextricably linked. Manufacturers cannot afford to slow innovation 
simply because it cannot be perfectly secured. To succeed, senior executives should build in security through a cyber risk program to become more secure, vigilant, and resilient. I want to take just a sec, Carla, and speak to why an economic development organization should care about this. So think of this is as disaster preparedness. So if your BRE program doesn't have programming related to what happens if a tornado hits uh, downtown Dubuque and you have uh, thought about data and, and everything that goes with disaster preparedness, you're missing a huge piece of BRE. This falls into that category. So this is a risk to your local economy. So what happens if you know all the companies in your industrial park just get completely slammed? That's a huge impact on your local economy. If I had to pick up all these topics um, that we're talking about today, and I was putting together a list of like monthly topics to get in front of people, folks, this would be the one that would be close to the top of the list, just because of the sort of the silent killer aspect that this could have. Oh, Rachel, I, I see here, is, um, you've got the, you just mentioned here to get a resilient, resiliency plan. Uh, excellent. That was just a kind of side comment, Carla. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, James is going to tell us a little bit about, um, you know, some of the other things that he's learning. It's not just for manufacturing. So he'll talk a little bit about smart main streets and mom and pop 4.0. We're not going to spend a ton of time on this uh, just for time because, but in Iowa, <clears throat> our industry 4.0 efforts are really focused right now on manufacturing, but every industry is being impacted. So you can see here, uh, if it's tourism, downtown, if you're downtown Dubuque, uh, Main Street community, things like uh, geofencing and being able to track the movement of uh, individuals and sending the ads to them when they're in your downtown space uh, or, or any of the other topics that we talked about, you know, automation and, and those types of things certainly apply to uh, or, uh, companies like your smaller companies. We just don't have the pool of resources right now to help those. Um, I put up here uh, heat maps. You know, think about your, if you have a conference center or a, a, a county fair, for example, could you map where your visitors are going and kind of put together a heat map so that you know where to put, put different kinds of vendors or, or uh, uh, display tables or, or whatever. There's, there's kind of any number of applications for this kind of stuff at the small, kind of we call it the mom and pop 4.0. Things like smart mirrors, where you could get on there and, and try on, put different types of clothing on, on you, so to speak, and then um, order it so your, your local clothing wouldn't necessarily have to have everything in stock. You'd be able to try on different things and how they look and then order through that place. It kind of creates a different uh, customer experience. And then even things like product visualization. So think of if you have a small retailer who focuses on tourists and people coming in and buying knickknacks or, or uh, small pieces of furniture, can they take their cell phone and uh, look at that and then take a picture and envision what that would look like in their home. Um, just things that we can, as economic developers, can get in front of our small businesses to help them so they don't get left behind by this uh, these transformation through industry manufacturing 4.0. So we want to spend a little time. Oh, go ahead. Come I was on. just going to say, I see QR codes are, are on your list. And I kind of thought that QR codes had gone by the wayside, but I was just at a conference last week and instead of handing business cards, several people showed me a QR code on my phone that then I had to utilize to get their contact information, but then it just went right into my phone. So <laughs> a, lot of, um, a lot of new technology, but based on kind of what I thought was something that uh, was older through the QR codes, but anyway, interesting. 
So what are you guys, let's take a look at the next slide quick. What are you guys hearing or what are you seeing out there? Agriculture, manufacturing, um, how about in your communities? What, what applications are you seeing? Well, but while you're thinking, I will point out agriculture is an area that has huge levels of uh, innovation that you as an economic developer can, can uh, tap into to not only uh, help people in the, the ag space, but also challenge you people in your other industries to how they, they might be able to apply some of the stuff. Uh, but you know, it's interesting. I was having a conversation with one of the Farm Bureau directors uh, down in Des Moines a, a few weeks back. And he put together uh, a day where he was going to host uh, individuals from his community and economic developers to come out and see what was going on in his farm and uh, all this kind of spraying and industry 4.0 related things. And two people showed up and, you know, it just suggested to him that our, connect, our local connection, thinking about uh, uh, agriculture, uh, as one of the huge drivers of industry 4.0 and, and innovation. Some, for many of it's top of mind, but not for everybody it's top of mind. So that would be something I'd challenge you to do is try to focus more on bring an ag to the conversation as well. Anybody else, anybody have any uh, uh, examples? Hospitality, uh, yeah, Val said hospitality industry needs a, a form of lean training, absolutely. And a lot of the uh, examples we have had in the past sessions of, are of the hotel and, and restaurant industry, how they're utilizing some of these aspects as well, like whether it's automation, automated flipping of burgers to a fully integrated hotel that you don't even have to check in. Aero seed or uh, using drain, drones to seed crop coverings. Oh, excellent, Darla. Anybody else? If not, Carla, we can keep moving. All right. So we, it's a little overwhelming, but you're not alone. So the, the rest of this little um, uh, of our presentation really focuses in on the resources and um, what you can, um, what you can do together to um, bring information to your, your businesses. So there's four basic things that you can do right off the bat, right? Educate your companies about what's out there. Um, maybe have some tours, webinars, share articles in your newsletters, use social media that um, really highlight the things that other businesses are utilizing. You know, um, work on initiatives that talk to students, um, parents, and educators that, you know, talk about the new way um, of working in a manufacturing field, that it's not just um, uh, being a cog on a line, but it's operating a robot. How are we, how are we talking to that next generation of the manufacturing worker so that um, it's clear that technology is changing things in manufacturing and they, um, there's a place for, for everyone there. Um, you can connect your manufacturers to the technical assistance and we'll talk about that. Um, you know, obviously in Iowa, we're lucky to have uh, Cirrus, and it's generally a first step for a lot of our manufacturers to kind of um, uh, take to, to dip their toe in and find out what, what might help. Um, and then, you know, you've got, uh, you're the reference librarian, so know your state programs. We're going to talk about um, the Iowa manufacturing plan uh, next, but what other R&D credits um, are there available that could help um, with your, um, help your manufacturers up their game in, in uh, Industry 4.0. And then of course, you're all doing this, working to expand high speed, uh, access to high speed internet across your, um, across your region. On that last point, I will say, being, go back to telling the story is showing not just that we need it, but how it's actually being utilized. In Iowa, we were really able to move the needle 
last year as far as the amount of dollars that are going to be put to it. Now we need to tell the story as to how, what impact that occurred. So bringing in some of the stories to show how that the high speed internet is, is, is benefiting Iowa businesses will, will help out at, in Des Moines for sure. Okay, so Iowa's Manufacturing 4.0 plan, um, they have their own website now, iowamanufacturing.com. Please check that out. Um, it's really based around four uh, or five um, focus areas that the state is gonna be working on, right? They wanna improve the supply chain linkages. They want to develop that digital infrastructure and uh, sustainable manufacturing. They are trying to work um, on technology adopts, adoption and utilization. They want to foster innovation for startups and scale-ups, and they want an effectively trained workforce. So all five of those areas have led to some um, legislative successes and some help for your businesses. So the first one um, is an IEDA grant, um, the Manufacturing Innovation Equipment Grants, and the Manufacturing Industrial Internet of Things Infrastructure Investment Grants. So businesses can um, do both of these. They can apply for, for both things, um, for equipment and for um, infrastructure investment. So a uh, business could get up to $75,000 total. Um, so the thing that you need to know is the eligibility. Um, they've got to be small uh, to medium size um, uh, businesses with between three and 75 full-time employees. They have to be within a certain NAICS code um, between 31 and 33. But again, on that website, that um, to iowamanufacturing.com, you'll, you'll be able to find out all the details on the NICS codes. 51% uh, of their revenue has to be from the sales of manufacturing goods. They have had to be in operation for at least three years. You also um, should know that they it's a one-to-one -one grant match. So if they're applying for $75,000, they have to have $75,000 cash skin in the game. And they must have had a serious assessment. And um, I'm gonna call on Mark because he was gonna share how many businesses had um, have had serious assessments already. Yeah, we've already had over probably close to 140 that have gone through or in the process of going through a serious assessment. And of those in Northeast Iowa, you could I believe there's about 30 that have gone through this assessment. Nice. So, so it's being well utilized. And the key here too is if we could do an assessment and they aren't up to the point that they can qualify for the grant, we part of the assessment is we'll work with them to see how we can get them to that point also. So. Yeah. And yeah, I would encourage your um, your manufacturers to go ahead and get an assessment, even if they're not planning on, you know, moving forward with a grant application, because you can learn so much from those assessments as, and get lots of tools and tips for um, what you can do, what your businesses could do right away. So just recently, um, there was um, more money put towards this effort for larger uh, companies. And this is uh, through grants.gov. So it's a different, um, uh, place to go for these gr uh, grant applications, but you, uh, business can apply for between 75,000 and 500,000. It's for, again, acquisition of industry 4.0 equipment and then specialized hardware or software. And this is sort of workforce related. So you need to be using the funds or you need to be able to state that you're using the funds to address workforce issues. You know, you're using automation because you cannot fill positions that you currently have or, you're, or you need to move certain um, skilled employees to other skills and you know, you're um, replacing their, their work with um, automated um, you know, a robot or a cobot, et cetera. So it's gotta be used to address workforce issues. The business has to be incorporated or at least authorized to do business in Iowa. Um, it's got to employ a minimum of 76 employees, and, but fewer than 250 full-time individuals across all the locations. 51% um, of their revenue has to be, again, from the sale of manufactured goods and, again, operate in an operation for at least three years. And the same NAICS codes um, as that small um, business grant. 
And then they also have to demonstrate negative economic impacts uh, due to COVID because they are using some of the COVID funding uh, to fund this program. There's a 25% cash, mat cash match. And in this, um, for this particular uh, grant, they do not need to have a serious assessment. Maria, do you have a comment about, so you unmuted, I didn't know if you had a comment. I do want to make sure that every people, uh, one of the, my, myself and um, our partners at Greater Dubuque Development reached out to um, industry in, in and around Dubuque County, and we targeted, you know, all the companies that met the criteria of the uh, employment area, 76 to 250. Um, and Carla did uh, notate that that is across all uh, organizational entities, and that is in not only in Iowa, but the but the nation, and then across into the across the seas. So that eliminated many of our companies. And we did verify that with IEDA is that it is 250 employees at max across all organizational entities. Um, so um, we had many companies obviously fall off of that. And I only say that because um, I don't you know, I don't want a lot of companies to get high hopes and you guys go out and help those individuals only to learn that it, they had 200 and some employees here in this, in Iowa and they had another plant somewhere else that had a hundred. And that's, as I understand, I'm going to say, as I understand, I was told directly by the person who's running it at IEDA that it's across all entities. So again, um, just wanted to shed some light on that. Yeah. Thank you, Greg, for um, highlighting that point. Anything else you want to share? I'm going to keep you off. Uh, don't go back on mute because I think you can um, speak to this next slide too. So the Community College 260 programs um, can help support adoption too. Um, from what we've learned, uh, the training programs have been given additional resources. And um, there are some 4.0 applications that have been added to that 260F application. And Greg, I don't know if you can um, speak any yep. more on that. Yes, I can. Thanks, Carla. So yes, uh, you know, between the 260 uh, C program, the E, which is incumbent worker training, the 260 F program is where it's been actually changed to incorporate um, tracking for tracking purposes, the 260 F incumbent worker program, the Iowa Economic Development Authority and the state of Iowa is looking at uh, specifically what print training programs are falling into the industry 4.0 categories. So we are tracking that and there was some additional funds put forth to the 60F program, 260F program to help um, with that expansion there. And like I said, the application has been changed to track those outcomes with industry 4.0. And then uh, the uh, NICC district alone, our community college is supplementing our uh, incumbent worker programs, uh, which is 260F, uh, WTED, um, uh, with some additional funding that we got from the federal government to do additional training on top of that. So uh, if within our area, any of your developers that want to contact us directly at NICC and know of a company that would need, need extra funding to help with anything to do with Industry 4.0 and outside of that, we have um, some additional funds that we would work directly with the company. Please call us to let us know if they would meet some of that criteria before you actually go out and maybe uh, spread that word amongst your uh, entities. And if you need any information, just contact me directly or email me and I can speak with you or send information. So we are at a very good time as it relates to workforce training and helping curve this gap with the workforce. Um, more companies are coming to us every day looking for some solutions. Thank you, Carla, for bringing this up. Yeah, thanks, Greg. And you had alluded to the um, consortium's roundtables that were going on across the state. So the community colleges are hosting those um, in all areas. And then they're taking that information, funneling it back through the um, one of the consortium committees, and it's going to build a new curriculum then based on what they're learning. And um, Cirrus is partnering to help develop that curriculum. And so keep an eye out uh, for that happening in your area too. I think that there's a couple of um, 
um, prototype trainings going on right now in, in a couple of the community college areas. But uh, as Mark had talked about, Cirrus has a lot of um, different services that can help your businesses. So Mark, I'm gonna turn this slide over to you. All right. Uh, so, you know, I think we covered this pretty much all the way through our, our conversation today, but uh, we pretty much covered just about everything within this wheel. We can do it through one-on-one. -on -one. We can do some things virtually. Uh, as you can see, I, I can go down this list, but the important ones are the webinars on demand, the technology videos, and webinar and training schedules that are going on around the state. Those are just beginning to get out there as I think James talked about. Uh, call us, call me, we can get you or your company hooked up to whatever uh, need that it is that you have with Industry 4.0. Mark, I can ask, uh, I think I know the answer, but these some of these trainings are certainly welcome to economic developers to attend. Yes, yes. Uh, I visited with, uh, uh, many of you know, Pam Wright in, out, out of uh, Hawkeye Community College. And, you know, she has been attending the Industry 4.0 sessions early on. And, and she's commented that, you know, I'm always kind of surprised that there's few, uh, there are how few economic developers are, are sitting in on these. Again, here, if you had to think through and look through the clutter, that would be an easy win for you uh, to sit in on some of those and just kind of hear some of the terminology being used and, and hear some of what's going on with uh, the uh, companies. So again, if I had to think of my short list, I'm going to have a little bit of cybersecurity. I'm going to have some tours related to uh, automation, but I, I'm, I'm going to have myself or my staff get involved in some of the serious training just to be fly on the wall uh, to hear what's going on. Yeah, you can get on our website and once again, the technology videos, the webinars on demand are there now, but uh, then you can get on there and see as we're going through, we offer the webinar and training schedule for new updated materials or new strategies or new technologies, feel free to attend. I would also add that the technology videos, if you're um, if you want to share the, the the serious wheel and each of those um, uh, different technologies, the, their um, videos are really short and brief and to the point um, branded videos for each one of those little um, parts of the wheel. So if you're ever thinking of educating your your own board or talking, you know, sharing with them what industry 4.0 is, uh, that's a good place to go and pull some videos as well. And I, I just like to echo that most of you know that NICC, uh, we are embedded with the folks at Cirrus and work with them hand in hand as in account management in our district. Um, on one of the topics, I just had a call uh, last week, I connected with the Cirrus representative today. Um, the whole supply chain uh, issue is probably more at issue with most companies than it is with work uh, workforce right now because they're not getting parts. So, and uh, Cirrus does have an event, I think on uh, the 2nd of December, uh, Mark, is that correct? On procurement, uh, which I would strongly uh, recommend as a, um, as a, as a workshop to, for um, area manufacturers, if they have uh, issues with uh, supply chain management, um, and I actually have a company that's going to be diving into that with a much deeper dive with resources from Mark Schneider at Cirrus. So that, and for other economic developers, uh, we're getting words here, uh, sharing information on the uh, emergency temporary standard with OSHA. I think every economic developer ought to become very aware of that in the next, uh, well, between now and January 4th or 6th, I'm not sure when that's supposed to come into play, but keep in mind um, that you need to become very aware of that because that's going to have a big issue as it relates to workforce as well, as far as what happens with OSHA. Um, there's not a lot of clarity on it, but I would start researching and looking at what's happening on the federal level as well as the state level. Um, and uh, there's a lot of ways that's going to probably pan out, but as soon as you get, you're going to get calls. I'm sure you're going to get calls on what to do. Yeah, most manufacturers and larger employers are wrestling with what they're going to do. And you're right, Greg, there isn't a, 
really a clear definition or clarification yet on those, but there will be by by the time it's implemented. So your HR people and your owners of the companies are sort of in a state of flux right now with having to meet those social requirements. January 4th is when that comes into yes. being. So like I said, there is not a lot of clarity. Uh, I know ABI has had some informational seminars on it and they're trying to grasp it at the statewide level, but on a local level, the more you as economic development uh, entities have an understanding of it because I, I would assume some people may be reaching out to you or you could proactively reach out to them once it becomes more clear. Excellent. Carl, I don't know on the next slide if we need to spend that much time on that. It's just that there are a lot of folks out here, all the community colleges, um, the regions, universities, and others. Uh, and many of the solutions are gonna, you're going to find are going to be coming from the private sector as well. And it's finding out who those folks are and sharing it within your regional groups. You're like, hey, I've there's a great company in Des Moines that helped our, our company do this or what have you. It's just that good exchange of, of information. I think that's going to be key. But, but the last slide that we have for you is, and, and we've had a lot of information. You've had a board meeting. We don't need to spend a ton of time on this today. But ask yourselves at, at your upcoming PI and Niven meetings, what can we do as regions uh, regarding this, and what if we do? What if we do nothing? I, I hope that through our conversations today, we've at least challenged you to to see that there is a role for economic developers in being proactive and, and uh, kind of creating a culture around this. Uh, and we certainly don't want to be laggards when it comes to this this topic. Um, but uh, we're certainly happy Carla and I are willing to, to visit with you either now or offline uh, as far as your regions go. If you want to think about, hey, we'd like to put two or three things together and, and, and uh, put together kind of a little um, back of a cocktail napkin plan, we'll be happy to help you with that. And, and as I know Mark and, and Greg would be as well. Uh, that's kind of what we had for our, our discussions today. We hope it's helped you some. Uh, uh, and we all kind of hope it kind of complements what you shared, Mark, and, and really appreciative to both you and, and Greg for comments. But we're happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Anybody have any anything that, that you're thinking of or uh, want to talk through? While they're thinking, I'll just say that, uh, again, we're sending this um, presentation out to you with live links. There are a lot more video links in it than we showed you today. So um, just uh, kind of keep that in mind as you as you move forward. We also, on our website, um, on IDM's website, we have added kind of a, um, a, a glossary of terms, so to speak. So we keep adding to that if you um, want to reference that every once in a while too. <laughs> so lots of terms you may be hearing when you're out there with your businesses. So we're trying to capture them and keep them all in one place. So we'll, um, we'll add a link uh, to our website for the glossary in there as well. Thoughts, comments, questions, concerns. Greg, Mark, any last comments from you all for the good of the order? Thank you for doing this. This is um, each time I think, oh, I, I, I know everything pretty well. I learned something each time that I hear presentations on this and you did an excellent job. Thank you, James and Carl. Thanks, Mark, for helping out. And this is a question for Mark. Um, Mark, with you being in Sears, we have Nibin as well as PEI on the call right now. Do you cover the, is your territory just pretty much Northeast Iowa? Um, or is there another contact in the region for Sears? Well, I am cover all 99 counties. Uh, there are other people that are, that cover Northeast Iowa. Uh, Greg, and you know covers 
for Cirrus in businesses. We also have a gentleman named Steve Wilson, who is now starting to cover more of the uh, Northeast Iowa. He's an account manager. So if you go on to the Cirrus website, you can see who covers what regions, uh, whether it be through the procurement group or through account managers or through the community college. So, so Mark necessarily businesses could meet with you or it would be one of the other two? Yes. Well, okay. if, you, if you have a need, you can contact me and I will directly contact them to whoever needs it or contact Greg. Either one of us will be a conduit to getting you to the correct resource at Cirrus. And I think you can sign up for assessments online. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, but yes. can yeah. go to that's how that's how you get assigned. That's how you get in the queue is you have to go online. And there was one distinguishing uh, fact or matter with those assessments um, that the requirement for the smaller sized companies, the up to 76, it is required that the assessment is there. On the larger uh, group, the 76 into 50, it is not required. However, it may be um, a good idea to have them. I think the only problem with that is, Mark, is it's still true that it may not be um, that grant uh, needs to be done by 1231 of 21. The, the grant application needs to be submitted by then. I don't know what Cirrus's backlog is currently on the assessments, but I've been told they may not be able to get to some of them companies in that larger group because a smaller group is required. And there is a distinguishing factor between the two grants. Yeah, and I think that's one of the main reasons why uh, the assessment was not required because it's just... We, we, I think the state and the whole group did like the need that was out there. And we were hoping to do those virtually. That didn't happen. We needed to be on site in the business to see what's going on. So uh, we've actually hired more people to be able to uh, get those assessments done. So yes, I think you're right on there, Greg. And I will just say, having gone through the manufacturing 4.0 stuff with Cirrus and having them visit, that they told us they were well below staffing levels, and it took weeks after we submitted the video to get someone here, and then that person didn't even watch the video. So you've got a lot of starting over when Cirrus gets there, which can be frustrating to some of your businesses if you don't know it in advance. So you might warn them that Cirrus isn't necessarily all the different people aren't seeing all the different things required to make this happen because they're trying to push them through as fast as possible. Yep, that's correct. Anyone else have any questions, comments? All right, well, we certainly appreciate your time. Uh, we are happy at any point in time, if either of your regional groups has uh, interest in, in kicking this around some more uh, on a specific topic or, or need uh, an overview of like this for anyone else, we're happy to, to visit with you about getting that done and certainly are here to answer any questions long term. So thanks for your time. We really appreciate it. And I'll turn it back over to you to put a bow in your, your meeting, but that our, our section of the, the day is complete. All right. Thank you, James and Carla. I don't know if we need to do anything else on the ECI, PEI side, do we, Katie? Um, no, we don't really, but um, I'll just throw this up to the group. Um, for that lean training, you know, January is kind of weather-wise not the greatest. Um, is Do you guys think that training would be effective virtually, or would we rather do that in person? I guess I'm okay with it virtually, because that'll make it maybe easier for a lot of people to be part of it, but I don't know what everybody else is thinking. Any other thoughts? I'm okay with it being virtual as well. How many of you want to drive in January to visit? I'd love to have you, but I don't want one or two people to come for, you know, just one or two people in the room, like today kind of thing, you know, so, um, and just knowing January, I see snowy weather. 
Um, do you guys think we would agree? I mean, have you guys done these lean trainings before? Is it okay virtually or is it better in person? I, I don't know what would be the difference than it's not anything different. else, okay. any other training like today's. I don't know if there's anything in that lean training that would be any more. It would be broken up into groups or? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm fine coming, you know, tuning in virtually too. So I don't know if that makes sense. Otherwise, yeah, okay, so we'll plan on virtual, you know, maybe for the winter months, you know, if you guys um, would all agree on that, um, we could do that and then just plan on meeting more in person when we know the weather, you know, isn't so treacherous for travel for folks. If, if, if everyone agrees to that, I'm just throwing that out there as an idea. I don't have an option with, I don't have a problem with that, but maybe the option is we start the PEI meeting at nine so we don't run into... Because you know, online, it takes a little longer for people to talk and be able to get their points out. So maybe we just meet at nine, and then by ten, we're ready for the the presentation. Perfect. I would. Um, I am totally fine with that. Does that work for everyone's schedules? Yeah, it's if I don't have to drive there, um, a nine o'clock meeting is completely easy to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe yeah, we'll plan on that. And I'll just run it by sharing the powers that be that we can change the meeting time and everything. I should that that should be fine. Um, but we'll plan on that for um, our next two virtual meetings at least. Um, planning on nine o'clock. Wonderful. Well, thanks everyone for being on today. Have a great week. Have a good Thanksgiving. You too. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Thank you for joining. Thank you.